Welcome to episode four of Field Days. And today we're talking all about planning a new spring food plot. And we're joined by Brandon Self from Whitetail Institute. He is the director of operations, worked for Whitetail Institute for over 14 years. He is an expert in the industry, and he's going to be taking us through all the steps in order to be successful in planning a new perennial food plot. Hello and welcome everybody to the fourth episode of Field Days and it is all about food plots all the time. We're talking spring related topics and today what we're going to talk about and this is going to take a little while to get through but it is going to be spring planning. You want to plan a new plot in the spring. We've talked about frost seeding up to this point. Um, Now we're to the point where you actually want to go in and and spray and kill the weeds and do a new planning. And that's what we're going to talk about today and take you through all those steps. Uh, I am joined today by Brandon Self from Whitetail Institute, who has worked for them for how many years? 14 years. 14 years. He's been there a long time, and he knows as much about food plots as anybody I've ever met. So um, we're we're happy to have him here with us and talk us through this. So let's talk spring planning and food plots. And, you know, you got a guy, and we get this all the time, hey, I want to put a new food plot in this spring. What should I plant? You know, and and the first thing we always say, I think you agree with this, is what do you want to accomplish? Right. You know, what are you looking to accomplish with this food plot? So I'll let you talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So so the biggest issue is, are you looking for a perennial plot that's going to be a constant protein source for, you know, three to five years? Or are you looking for something just for spring and summer so you can plant a fall annual later in the year for hunting attractions? So we have, you know, many different options as far as perennials to go, but we really only have one option for a spring summer annual Mm -hmm. in our lineup. Um, But it really depends, you know, if you're looking for a good constant protein source, then we need to stick to perennials and, you know, it's going to feed and attract all year long. Sure. Uh, But if you want to split it up, like we were talking about an earlier podcast, you know, plant spring and summer annual, the power plant, and then there's different ways to utilize that power plant come fall time. Sure. Sure. Yeah. And and I'll say this to a lot of guys. I think a lot of guys out there have the, misconception that uh, fusion, which is your clover and chicory blend and your imperial clover blend, that those are really only good for early season. Mm -hmm. And for me and my own personal experience here in Northwest Pennsylvania, that couldn't be farther from the truth. I have a a check trail cameras, you know, and it's been a couple months, you know, went out and I think it was end of January, early February, we had about, I don't know, six, seven inches of snow on the ground. And I had, uh, I think it was 12 or 13 deer in one trail camera picture on one of my fu- fusion plots right and you know i've seen my clover and fusion get hammered all the way through yeah. winter it's not just necessarily a you know beginning of the season and that's yeah. all it's going to be good for and i think guys have a little bit of a misconception with that when they're when they're looking at planting and i hear a lot of guys say oh i'm gonna <clears throat> i'm gonna plant fusion or clover here in the spring then i'm gonna disc it under and plant an annual in the fall and i'm always like just kind of shaking my head. Why would you do that? You yeah. know, I mean, it's real hard for me to disc under a good looking perennial. Plant. Yeah. And there's really no, I mean, there's no reason to, because like you say, it draws just as well in the fall as some fall annuals. It does. You know, it's, yeah. it's, uh, and you know, I, I never want somebody to invest the money that a perennial costs. You know, this, you know, you're paying for that longevity. You're yep. paying for the three to five years. So you don't really want to, pay that money and have it only for a year and then disc it up. There's really no purpose to it. Sure, sure. And, you know, and I don't even understand why you want to do that. You know, you hear a lot of talk about your soil health and and not disking and tilling it all the time if you can avoid it. Well, you take care of your perennial plot. It's going to last you five years. And I've told you, I haven't have some of mine going six years now. Yeah, that they're right. And I'll ride out a perennial plot as long as I can. Sure. You know, and I don't get me wrong. I have a lot of annuals and we've talked in other podcasts how I split my food plots and I like to have half in a perennial and half in an annual and then I'll rotate them. But man, I have a real hard time when I hear a guy say, oh, I'm going to plant a perennial in the spring and then disc it under and plant an yeah. annual. It's like, well, how would you do that? Yeah. But, I try to talk them out of it. Some people just want to do it. Sure. But, you know, it's, yep. it's not what we recommend. Yeah. No, I get it. Uh, so, you know, talk a little bit about your perennial blends. Um, what are the options for guys in the spring as far as the perennial blends from, from White Tail Institute? Well, really any of the perennial blends you can plant except for vision you don't want to plant vision because it has our kale in it sure and kale's a fall crop you know uh but 
any clover fusion extreme chick magnet alpha rack plus edge all of our perennial lineup besides the vision are great to plant in the spring a um, little bit of the pros and cons um, pros of planting in the spring is you know you get a little more growth for hunting season yeah uh, you know yeah. and then planting in the fall you don't have to deal with the weeds as much sure to, the first year while it's trying to get established yeah. but um but really any perennial that we have besides vision is commonly planted in the spring sure sure i know for me personally a lot of the the spring stuff I try and frost seed, you know, now if it's an annual and, mm-hmm. and if that works, then if it doesn't, then I end up replanting it in the fall, Yeah, you know, yeah. And, and a lot of guys are doing that. But if you're looking at planting a, a spring plot, which a lot of guys do, you know, and, and uh, for me personally, you mentioned weeds. I don't plant near as much as I used to in the spring just cause it's because from, of that. Yeah. From my area. I mean, we deal with weeds and, you know, I was fighting weeds all summer long. And, uh, so, you know, I end up planting a lot of my perennials in the fall and stuff now, but a lot of guys are out there and it's perfectly acceptable. Like you said, it's going to be established. Those deer are going to be used to going there. You're going to have, like I said, a more established plot come the fall. So, um, a lot of positives to, to planting perennials in the spring. Uh, let's talk a little bit about power plant. Okay. Power plant is, and, you know, I've worked with this company for a long time, and not just because I work for the Whitetail Institute, but it's probably the best spring-summer annual blend that I've ever seen. Sure. Um, it it serves a lot of different purposes. You, uh, the deer use it to bed in. They'll use it to travel through, uh, graze on. Um, it's a real tall, thick, gnarly crop. It gets six or eight feet tall, you know, depending on your ground. Yeah. Um, but the, the purpose behind it is... It's got beans and peas in it, yep. which everybody wants and the deer love, and, but it's got trellis crops in it. It's got sorghum and it's got sun hemp, so those beans and peas climb those stalks, and it keeps the deer from overgrazing them. So you don't have just a pea bean field that they're going to wipe out overnight. Sure. You know? So you get a little longevity out of it. It'll last you. And up here in the northeast, a common recommendation that I give is let your power plant go. Plant it, let it grow all through the spring and summer then come fall time what you can do is mow rows through the standing power plant so you've got the height and security of that standing power plant even if it's dead the deer still think they're secure they think there's still this thick tall crop that's hiding them and and take those rows and disc those rows up and plant a fall annual in there Mm -hmm. later so you get you get a full service full year out of a power plant plot just by disking those rows up and planting a fall annual in it but it's a great product. I will tell you just from personal experience, you need to plant at least an acre of it. Yeah. A half acre, they'll wipe it out. Sure. Unless you can fence it or, you know, you have a way to keep the deer out of it. But it's, it's, uh, you need to, you need to get a good field, good size field. And a lot of people I've had, and I've had this happen to myself, you'll see, you'll walk around the field. You can't see over in it unless you get up in a tree stand, but a lot of times the deer will feed on that stuff from the inside out. So okay. you'll think, well, the deer aren't even in here using it. Well, the deer are. They'll go to the center of this plot. They'll bed in it. They'll eat in it. So if you get up in a tree stand and you look down onto this power plant plot, there's a big empty hole in the middle uh-huh. where the deer, that's where they use it because yeah. they go in there and it's secluded. Sure. So they use it really heavily in the center and then they eat their way out of it. And so it's a, it's a really interesting crop, but it is by far the best spring and summer annual I've ever planted. Sure. And I know guys year after year, I mean, this, you guys sell out of this every year. Every year. Every year. And, and faster it, every and year. And it doesn't take long. No. And there's a reason for that. I mean, as more and more guys use it. And I think, you know, the biggest one I've seen, you know, I planted power plant. It's been a few years now. Had great success with it here. I didn't plant a big enough, you yeah. know, and, and the deer, they love it. I mean, they'll, they'll mow it down. So you need to be planting at least an acre a lot depends on your deer density and stuff like that as well a lot of things we we don't know with each individual person what their you know situation is and and all that but you know you get like oh man the deer just mowed it down you know and and you got to plant enough of it but that's a good thing that the deer love it it so much you know that's what you want and you sell out of it every single year so you know i tell guys like hey if you want to get power plant in this year get it make sure yeah make sure you get your order in but uh it gets more and more popular and you hear more and more about it every single year yeah and we changed the blend a little bit last year and we we took some products out and we added sun hemp to it so now you can spray it with the rest max early if it's starting to get taken over by grass okay. you can spray it to kill the grass out of it early usually though once the power plant gets going 
it's it's so tall and thick it, it shades out most of your weed competition sure. so weeds are not normally an issue with it uh, i will recommend anybody that plants power plant as it's starting make sure and and we use this on all of our products um and a lot of people don't it's an old school way of measuring but put a browse cage in it yeah and you know that way because a lot of people will call and say well it's not growing well it probably is but the deer are on it so heavily that sure. they're they're grazing it to the ground so put a browse cage in it and it'll tell you the difference of what's growing inside and what's growing outside sure. so you get a little gauge of it for yep. sure yeah now power plant is it like your typical annual you know you don't want to plant more two, more than two years in a row and, and rotate it is it it's you somewhere. probably do want to rotate it. You yeah. know, I, I believe that you should always rotate, you know, every couple, two or three years. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, I do. I suggest that. Sure, sure. Yeah. But the moral of the story, power plant, great spring plot. Right. It's an it's, annual plot, but yeah. a great spring plot. And one more point to the power plant that, that I always recommend is once you plant the power plant and you've got your soil test and you've done all that, added your fertilizer, you know, your lime, and everything's good and you plant it, 45 days after you plant that power plant, you need to go back and give it a boost of nitrogen. Okay. And and that really makes a huge difference in the growth stage from the first four or six inches up until it gets up to the six or eight sure. feet tall. So always do that with the power plant. Yep. Perfect. Okay. So, you know, we kind of talked about what you want to plant, you know, what the options are. I think the one thing you touched a little bit on, and I get this a lot of times from a lot of guys where they say they're going to plant an annual, like they're going to plant turnips in the yeah. spring. And I don't... I don't ever really understand that, you know, why guys want to do that. I, I know sometimes it's, you know, goes to soil building or, or some soil health type things. Right. Um, but for the most part, for those guys that are newbies out there, I want you to understand for the most part, you, you know, you want your annuals in, in the fall, you know, you're going to get the, like, for instance, your turnips and stuff, you know, that's when the deer are going to eat them is, is into the winter. Once right. you get those freezes and they sweeten up, yeah. you know, to, unless you're planting something in the spring, to improve your soil health, mm -hmm. you know, and it, it really doesn't make a lot of sense to it plant doesn't. those. It doesn't. And a lot of people want to do it. We kind of try to steer them clear of that. The, the problem is fall annuals are designed for colder weather. I mean, that's what makes the deer eat them, especially brassicas, turnips, uh, beets and greens, winter greens, tall tine tubers, all that stuff. If you plant it early in the spring, what happens is it matures so fast. It's such a fast grower. That's mm -hmm. why it's so great in the fall. It's such a fast grower. It matures so fast and gets big stems on And you've probably seen it in your fall plants. Sure. They'll get big stems on them. And the bigger those stems get, the more fibrous the crop gets. And a deer's stomach cannot take that big fibrous stalk so sure. they're not going to fool with it so yeah. there's really there's really no benefit of planting them in the sure. springtime yeah and that's what i tell guys and a lot of times it's just a guy thinking oh man i'll put some you know they don't eat turnips all year long they're not going to do that so yeah. um we we encourage you to steer clear of that so yeah. next thing you know and this might be the first thing we should always start with because it's it is the number one thing you need to do and let's talk soil samples yeah well, yeah it's, it's no no doubt it's the most critical part of of food plotting and you know, we always tell people, get a soil test from anywhere you need to. If you don't want to use ours, you can use someone else's. Ours are specifically geared for our products. So they're easy to read, easy to comprehend, and you know exactly what to do to grow our products. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's a small investment for a lot of insurance. Sure. You know, uh, yeah. it's definitely, it's going to tell you fertilizers you need, uh, lime you need. It's going to tell you the CEC of your soil, which... Basically, in layman's terms, is telling you how well drained your soil is, and yep. we can tell a lot by that. Sure, and, and and it tells us a lot about your independent soil type. But uh, there's really, I there's really no need to plant without doing a soil test. Sure, and you know, I talk about the Facebook group. Um, I should probably throw that out there. It's uh, food plots for whitetail, and I deal with a lot of guys that ask a lot of questions. You get a lot of guys coming in, giving some really good feedback to guys. And you got guys coming in that, quite frankly, aren't giving very good advice. And I've seen everything from, I haven't soil tested in 15 years and my stuff grows great. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and all you need is 13, 13, 13, this much, and you're good to go. Yeah. And I mean, I'll fight with these guys on blue and face, and, and usually they'll realize, I said, listen, you, you know, you're from the, you know, this one guy was from fertile Midwest, you know, and maybe that worked for him. But I was like, listen, you're talking to guys from New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, New York, um, places where the soil is not the same as yours. And to tell a guy to flat out that he doesn't need to do a soil sample, 
I just, I hate to say it anything else. It's terrible, terrible advice. It is. It's just the worst advice. If a guy tells you not to worry about a soil sample, then stop taking advice from that guy. Yeah, like, no doubt. It's just, you know, not the guy you want to talk to because, quite frankly, he doesn't know what he's talking about. And we talk about the White Tail Institute soil sample kits. They're 13 bucks. Yep. That's what I use for all mine. And the main reason I love them is they make it super easy. You know, yep. I can put exactly what I'm planning. I'll say I'm plant, I want to plant fusion or pure attraction in here. I get the exact recommendations for that blend of what I need to do to that plot. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not wasting any money throwing down fertilizer. And that's what guys don't realize a lot of times with your soil samples is, you know, after that first year and you bite the bullet and you get the pH up where it's supposed to be, a lot of times you don't need much lime and fertilizer. So if you're just not doing a soil sample and you're going out and winging it and throwing through, you maybe didn't need anything. Yeah, exactly. And it could be to the detriment instead of the benefit yep. you know, of adding things. You add too much nitrogen, you're feeding weeds. Yep. Um, I will say, you know, if a customer calls and they have they want to do a soil test but they need it right then and they've got a local place that they can take their soil to and get their actual soil test to do that instead of going and buying a test kit that you do at home and all that make sure to send your dirt out sure get it analyzed get it back so you'll know exactly what you're dealing yeah, with sure but, and you know that's the the kind of the two groups you get of guys that are making comments the one is don't worry about it you don't need a soil sample and the other one is just send it to your local co-op or your local university and things like that. And and that and that's fine. It'll get you, you know, by. But but what I would say to you is if you're a new guy, that's gonna be hard for you to understand. Yes. You're not gonna understand what they're saying. And that's what White Tail Institute tries to help the new guy. So what I'd say to you, yeah, if you're an expert out there and you're you know, you know your stuff when you get a soil sample result back from the local university, by all means, you know, Do send it. it in there. Mm -hmm. You know, but if you're a new guy and you're just getting started, you know, I would encourage you the the White Tail Institute soil sample kits are going to make it easier for you. They're going to make it easier to understand. Yeah, and you know, at 13.95, I think is what they sell for. You get the soil test you send it off, usually within 48 hours of the lab getting it, sometimes the same day. Yep. They have the results to you. They can email them to you. They can mail you the results where you can have it in paper form. And also, you can call. You know, you get your results and you can't understand them or you have a question, you call us. Sure. You know, you, you go to a ag, ag store and, and you get your results back and you call them. Sometimes they may be able to help you. Sometimes they won't. Sure. But, it's our products you're planting, so you want to keep it close to the heart. Yep. You know, get the soil test from us, send it in, get the results, call us, we'll go over it, have your plan ready, and then you're ready to go. Yeah, absolutely. So that's just some advice with, with soil samples. Now, once you get your soil sample back and you have your lime and your fertilizer recommendations, so ideally for a spring plot, when is it that we should soil sample and lime, and then when do we want to fertilize? Yeah. So if you've done... Previous years, if you've done some work to the soil, you probably could get away with doing it in the spring, you know, early in the spring as you can. Um, get it in. If you have to have lime added, go ahead and add the lime as soon as possible. Sure. Um, you know, ideally it would be getting it done in the fall before and getting the lime on, but if not, just do it in the spring as early as you can, get the lime down, and then you'll fertilize when you plant the seed. Sure. Yeah. Um, and, and let's talk, there's two different kinds of lime. Yeah. There's there's ag lime and there's pell lime. And real quick, it's a common question we get. What should I use, ag lime or pell lime? So let's just real quick talk about the difference. Sure. Well, you can use either. Uh, ag lime is, is a hassle to deal with. Mm -hmm. um, it's cheaper, but and it lasts longer. Um, it's not as uh, pelletized lime is easier to use. It costs you a little more. Uh, doesn't last quite as long, but it boosts faster. So, you know, there's pros and cons of both, but any lime, I tell people, any lime is better than no lime. Mm -hmm. uh, even if you can have to get hydrated lime, I've had customers use hydrated lime. Now, you talk about a mess. It's a mess. But um, basically, that's the biggest difference. Pelletized lime, boost it faster, doesn't last quite as long. Um, ag lime is going to last you a little longer. Sure, and I'll just throw out my personal experiences. You know, when you when you do a new food plot, Generally, there's some sticker shock. Yeah, you know when you when you're doing a half acre plot and it says you need seven ton of lime, you're just like good grief. And pell lime, that's expensive. Yeah. You know, I call the local rock quarry and I man, I can get ag lime over there for ten bucks a ton. Yeah, you know, it's like oh, let's do that. And I did that with most all my plots in the first year. Mm -hmm. You know, did the ag lime, but like you said, 
we ended up spreading it with shovels, yeah. taking a truck around, throwing it out. I mean, it was it's a mess. It was miserable just dealing with it, you know. And I've heard of guys using manure spreaders, yeah, as being a really good way to to spread ag lime and things like that. But the biggest negative, and you'll find this out if you decide to go the ag lime route to to save some money. You're going to eventually probably find it in the the hassle sometimes, unless you have an, and I know in some places there are some people who come out and yeah they'll spread, spread it, it for you. But a lot of guys, you know, if you're doing a food plot in the woods, they're not going to get not equipment. Coming. Yeah, and a lot of times they won't come for less than three or four tons. Yeah, you know? yeah. So so you know you're going to have to make a decision, and, and you know with ag lime, like I said, man, we got to the point we had a a lime spreader. But, you know, getting the lime that we got had rocks in it and it kept jamming it yeah. up and it was miserable. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. And we, uh, you know, so pretty much now, you know, it's it's mostly Pell lime for yeah. us just because of the ease to use. And pelletized lime, you can actually, for, for our soil tester recommended at Ag Lime, but if you can actually cut the pelletized lime down by 15%. So yeah. whatever, if it's four tons, you can use 15% less than that if you use pelletized sure, lime. Sure, sure. So just some things to keep in mind when it comes to comes to your lime, but yeah. uh, it can it can be a, it can be a pain. Um, now let's talk about fertilizer. OK, um, we've got our fertilizer recommendations back. When do we want to spread fertilizer on the on a spring new planting plot? When you plant. Yeah. OK. So power plant, um, any perennial when you're planting your spring plot, you're establishing a spring plot. Fertilize when you plant. That way your seeds are getting the best benefits out of the nutrients you're adding and the weeds aren't feeding off of them before your seeds do yeah so yeah and that's it was funny you know when we were talking last night and you know i come from that old farmer mentality i guess where i do too (laughs) where you hear don't spread your fertilizer the same day as your seed you you burn your seed so i I, honestly i've never (laughs) spread my fertilizer on the same day i did my seed i always it was generally usually a week before I try and get my fertilizer on the ground. And you made a good point last night. You said, listen, when you do that, all your fertilizer is really doing is fertilizing weeds. That's it. You know, and you're letting that weed get, get a chance. Yeah, get a chance. Whereas if you, you know, wait until the the day you're seeding, you know, it's 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 not, you know, not getting ahead of you. So that was new for me. So going forward, you know, that's what I'm going to do. But I have bit. And, and then a lot of times, some of our products, the products too, you want to fertilize, hit it with fertilizer a little bit later yeah. after planting as yeah. well. Yeah, so. especially the power plant. Yeah. It's a heavy eater of nitrogen, so you do need to add a boost. Sure, sure. Okay, so that's it with lime and fertilizer. I mean, we could talk fertilizer and all the different, you know, we t- talked a little bit about it in other podcasts, the, you know, what the numbers mean and things like that. But I guess the the bottom line is, is you could go to just about any of your co-ops or you could call Whitetail Institute, because you're going to get fertilizer recommendations. And guess what? Your co-op may not have mm-hmm. exactly what you're looking for. You can go to that co-op and what we always is get close. Yeah, you get know, close. if it's calling for, you know, 3600 and all they have is 4600, well, that's going to get you close. You won't need as much of it, you know, and yeah. things like that. So we, we discussed that in some other podcasts, but, you know, you get your you get your soil sample back, you know, you can always call Whitetail Institute. You know, always. they're going to they're talk you through it and say, okay, here's... You, you can say, hey, here's what my co-op has. You know, how can I make this work? Yeah. And they're going to help you through exactly. it. Exactly. You know? Yeah. All right. So next on the list is, <clears throat> so we soil sampled. You know, we got that in. We've limed. Um, when do we want to spray? Because you're going to want to spray to kill everything in the plot. Right. And how soon can we do that? When do we want to do it? And what do we want to spray it with? Well, you, glyphosate is what you want to use before you plant. Um and when to when to spray it is if you see green it's growing you can spray it um the best practice is to spray it let it die turn the ground and then let those seeds that you dug up let them green up spray it again then disc it up and you can start your plant the more you can do that the the more weed free seabed you're going to have sure um but you know you definitely want to spray and if you don't have time to spray and disc and spray and disc spray let it die you know, it could be a week to 10 days, let it die off, disc it up and start your planting sure, process. Sure. Yeah. And, and I should tell guys, you know, you see this a lot. Like I think guys get confused with what spray is what, and you see Roundup, Roundup. Well, there's a million different Roundups, yeah. you know. And, well, there's a million different glyphosates Yeah, and there's one Roundup, yeah. you know, yeah. so there's 
so many different trade names. As long as it's glyphosate yep. and we recommend 41%, sure. it's good. Yeah, and, and that's what I tell guys. I mean, you can go to your tractor supply or wherever, and you're, you, who cares what the name is? That You're looking for 41% glyphosate yeah, exactly. is what you're looking for. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, that's what you're going to spray. And, and like you said, ideally, you know, you want to get in there um, – when it's green and up, spray it. Usually that's, I don't think you said, usually then you're waiting seven to 10 days yeah. is about yeah. the time frame that you will really start seeing that stuff die. Mm-hmm. Then disc it again, wait seven to 10 days. You should start to see it greening again, hit it again. You wait seven to 10 days, disc it and plant. Yeah. Yeah. And at the same time, we understand like in the spring, so we were talking about like, man, you're going to get into, you know, here in Northwest Pennsylvania, you start getting a little late into the year. So, I mean, there's been many times that I've sprayed it once and planted just and planted, yeah. you know, yeah. and, and it's been fine. Yeah. But if you have the time and you can do it, it's really going to help you with your, your weeds. If you can do that right. twice. Right. Right. Yeah. right. Cause anytime you turn in the dirt, you're turning dor- dormant weed seeds Correct. up. So yeah. Yeah. More you can kill them. Okay. So now let's talk a little bit. We, we've sprayed, we've killed everything. We're ready to plant, you know, what, when are we looking to plant? You know, what, what's the time frame that we want to plant a new spring plot? Well, of course, it's different where I'm from than where you are. Um, we usually say wait till all chance of frost is gone for perennials. That's, you know, our common recommendation. Uh, you know, you just don't want a really heavy killing frost on a young tender plant. It's just not good for it, mm-hmm. you know. Um, so, you know, make sure all chance of frost is gone. If you get it in a little early and there's a light frost on it, it's not going to do any damage. Sure. But now power plant's a different ball game. Power plant, you have to wait until the ground temperature is at least 65 degrees. It's very susceptible in early stages of growth to frost. Mm-hmm. So, it, you know, if you if you have, you plant it too early, it grows, it germinates, you see a good field coming, then you have a frost, boom, you're done. You're going to have to replant. So what I say normally is when farmers are planting soybeans, plant. Okay. Because they're gonna, they're not going to plant early. Yeah. They're going to make sure that all chance of frost is gone. Uh, and you know, every year, every now and then, you may have a freak thing happen, and you have a frost really late. But there's nothing you can do about that. But ground temperature sixty five degrees at least, do it then. And you know, that's a rule to stick by. For sure. Plant. Sure. Something we we didn't talk about yet that we probably should is. Soil conditions, you know, is there any particular soil conditions that are better for certain perennials? Um, you know, what kind of soil conditions are you looking for for power plant? You know, you're going to say, okay, you're going to stay away from sandy, rocky soils, for you know, whatever it is. So on the perennial side, what type of soil conditions for what particular blends? So clover and fusion, we like to plant bottom ground, heavier soils that hold moisture, as long as they're not standing water. Uh, you know, river bottoms, creek bottoms, something that's going to hold a little moisture. Um, you got hillsides that drain well. Um, you want to go with Alpha Rack Plus or Edge. They like a well-drained soil. If you've got rocky, junky soil, you know, that just doesn't do well with perennials but they, like clover, but you want to try a perennial, Extreme is your best option. Mm-hmm. It's basically going to grow anywhere. Sure. Uh, it's real hardy, real high protein, so, it, you know, and it'll grow in adverse soil conditions. Check- on, ex- on Extreme, real quick, just because yeah. I've been seeing this a lot lately, it's a slow starter. It is. Like, we get guys freaking out, hey, I planted Extreme. And it's it's not growing yet, yeah. and it's just a little bit slower starter it than does. some of the other ones. It does, yeah. you know, and, and most perennials, we're going to say, at fourteen to twenty one days, you should have germination and sometimes decent growth. Mm-hmm. Extreme's going to be a little behind that. So fourteen days of clover, you're probably going to have very visible clover. Sure. Fourteen days of extreme is going to be kind of sporadic, but I will say this too: all perennials that we have, the second year is always better. Yeah. You, so, so the first year you plant it, it may be spotty. I mean, that's just the nature of the beast. Second year it fills in, especially if you're frost seeding. Yep. So, so the second year of a perennial is always going to be. But now, sometimes you hit it just right. Your first year is great, and you really, you know, you just hit it right. But sometimes it's not, and, and the second year is always going to be better, especially with extreme. Sure, sure. Okay, so and then power plant. What kind of soil conditions are you looking for? Power plant. The biggest thing with power plant is you don't want to plant it where there's a lot of moisture. Yeah. You, you know, it doesn't like number one because it's tall. It you know, so the wind blows in soft ground, it could lay it over. Uh, so well drained soils that have a little sand in them are fine. Just as long as it's not mucky wet soil, you should be fine. Okay. All right. So lastly, then as far as uh, spring planting. So we went through, you know, we've we've talked about soil samples, you know, when to plant, you know, all that good stuff. Now we've got our seed in the ground, it's growing. When you plant stuff in the spring, you're gonna have some plot maintenance. Mm-hmm. You know, especially with 
perennials. Um, you, you talked a little bit about power plant that it's a rest friendly. You can hit it with a rest if you're seeing grasses, but for the most part, most part, your perennials, you're going to have some maintenance and that's going to include herbicides and mowing. Mm-hmm. So let's talk a little bit about what you want to do with those plots then throughout the, the spring and summer months. Yeah. Okay. So mowing is, you know, probably the best means of mechanical weed control that you can use. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, anytime, anytime you see a weed coming in, before it goes to seed, you definitely want to mow it. Mm-hmm. You don't want any weed to go to seed because then those seed heads are going to fall and then you're going to have more and it's just a never-ending story then. So clipping the tops out of the weeds, clipping the tops out of your perennial. Every perennial we have, you need to mow. Yep. So clip the tops out of the weeds, you clip the tops out of the crop. Uh, if your crop gets up, you know, 16 18 inches and you don't have any weeds you probably still need to go in there and just clip it down just sure. cut the tops out of it get new growth going um a little more palatable the deer will eat it better um and then as far as spraying herbicides are great and but but the thing is it's not a solve all you know our herbicides don't kill everything but they kill a lot and they're, they're your best option for weed control. So make sure, you know, you try to, you, the biggest thing is try to get the weed, try to figure out what the weeds are you're dealing with. Sure. Once you figure that out, and we can help you with that. You call the Whitetail Institute, we'll, we'll help you figure out what you're dealing with. Yeah, you actually have a full-time we weed do. specialist. What's his name? Yeah, Dr. Carol Johnson. Yeah. Yep. And he's one of the best in the business. He knows more about weeds than I'll ever, yep. ever know. But, uh, you know, there's... Different weeds, and, and like I say, some of our, our herbicides don't control all of them. They control a majority of them. But, you know, recognize what the weed is and then, you know, prepare your plan from there. But you want to slay herbicide. You can spray early to get two different ways of kill through the leaves and through the root system. So sometimes you can catch them before they get going, and that really helps. And it kills the existing, but you want to try to get them when they're young. Sure. Uh, grass the same way. You want to try to get it at the four to six inch range. Once it gets taller, it's harder to kill. Yeah. Um, but but the rest max sometimes uh, I know you've never had to spray more than once. Sure. Uh, but if a perennial grass gets advanced, uh, sometimes you have to spray it one time. Give it you know, and that's another thing I want to mention with a rest max. Four, fourteen days is the earliest you're going to see any sign of it working. Sure. So don't you know? Don't spray it and think it's going to work like Roundup. Fourteen days, and what happens is you'll see the tips of the grass start to turn. Okay, so that means the herbicide's working, but it's going to be twenty-one, sometimes twenty-eight days. You'll see whole plant symptoms. So mm-hmm. the whole plant will look like it's dying. So be patient with it. And if you spray it, and you know a lot of the grass is gone, but you still have some left, spray it one more time. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it, you know, don't be impatient with it because it is a slow-acting herbicide. Sure. Yeah, I've been I've been fortunate here in Northwest Pennsylvania. Uh, uh, I've been able 99% of the time, I, like I told you, I don't think I've ever had to spray more than yeah. once. And, you know, I've, I catch it early in the spring, I spray it, and then I just mow it throughout yeah. the summer. And, you know, as far as mowing, I might mow as many as four or five times throughout the summer, That's depending right. on how much rain we have. Mm-hmm. You know, if we get a drought, it's like anything. You don't want to mow your yard in a drought. You know, you're going to stunt the growth, so you got to use your head um, if you have a severe drought or don't have rain. But if you have a, you know, a normal summer and you're getting a bunch of rain, you, you can mow a lot throughout yeah. the summer, and that's going to be the best thing to control those weeds. And uh, just briefly on the on the herbicide, we talk about this, and it drives me nuts because we get guys, you know, don't get that, don't get that, get this and that. This is a lot cheaper, and it's the same thing. Well, what they're talking about is, is there are other uh, cheaper uh, possibilities out there for, for sprays that are the same thing, but you're going to buy them in bulk. Yeah. You know, you're going to be getting five gallons, one ga- – you know, and we – Create our sprays are in much smaller containers. They're for the guy that is spraying two acres at most in, in food plots, mm-hmm. you know. And what we tell guys is, is if you got 10 acres or 20 acres that you're spraying, by all means, buy in bulk. You mm-hmm. know, that's fine. But if you're a guy that you, you're you looking at and you're like, man, I got an acre, but I can get this a lot cheaper and I'll have it. You got a shelf life of two years yeah. with that herbicide before it's not going to be any good. And secondly... If you're in the north, you better make sure you have that herbicide in some temperature control room. And you're going to bring your herbicide into your house, yeah. you know, or do you have a, you know, a heated garage? Because if not, you you know, let that freeze or whatever, it's, it's going to be no good for you. Right. So for a lot of guys, buying 
their herbicide in bulk like that just doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah, you it know? really doesn't. Yeah, so it's not that, you know, White Tail Institute's out there just trying, it's, it's, we're not selling it in bulk. We're selling it in small containers for guys doing, you know, just a couple acres of food plots and it makes sense for them. And then the second big thing we said is the customer service you're going to get. And you're not going to call any of those um, herbicide companies and get a, a weed specialist no, to talk to. No. And you could call, yeah. you know, any, anytime you're in the field, and you're out there, and you, and say you get out there, and the the label's falling off the bottle. You don't know how to mix it. You can call us. We yep. tell you exactly what to do, yep. uh, how to spray it, when to spray it. You know, if you have a question about why it's taking so long, call us. Sure. If you want help identifying the weed, call us. You know, we do have the customer service to back up. And look, you're you're paying a little more, but you're buying it in quantities that fit you, just sure. like you said. Sure. And you know the money that it can save you in the long run instead of letting the weeds take over your crop and then having to replant. Yeah. You know, the the fifty dollar bottle of slay is worth the investment if you can save your crop. Yeah. Or keep it going even a, a year. Sure. You know, that saves you the investment of having to buy that seed again. Yeah, so. absolutely. And and it's like I say to everybody, hey, if you're if you're an expert and you've been planting food plots for 50 years and you know this stuff inside and out, by all means, you're not looking for that customer support. If you're a new guy out there and, yeah. and you know, you're just getting started, I mean, you need that. You know, exactly. you need that support. You can call anytime. You know, you can talk, talk to a weed specialist. So a lot of benefits to using the, the White Town Institute herbicides, uh, you know, that don't get mentioned a lot. Yeah. That's that's the reason. But uh, you know, that's that's all I think we really had on on planting a spring food plot. And like we said, spring food plots are a, a great way to establish your food plot early. Everybody's different, you know, yeah. and, and I know like I plant the majority of my stuff in the fall now, but I am planting power plant this yeah. year in the spring and uh, super excited about it. And you know, like I said, everybody's different, but if you are gonna plant a spring food plot, these are the steps. Yeah. Yeah. And a couple of things just to hit on the herbicide so we know. The herbicides, we get this question a lot. How how rain fast is it? So how 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 long before a rain can we or a rain comes can we put it on? As long as you've got it on for an hour or so, you're really safe. Yeah. So so you know that's a a question we get a lot. Get it on. Just don't, don't spray it in the rain. Sure. You yeah. probably want to say something about Surefire Crop Oil. Yeah. Make sure any any herbicide, you could tank mix both herbicides. If you have grass and broadleaf problems in your crop, tank mix both of them and add the Surefire Crop Oil. It, it, the slay especially is not going to work without the Surefire Crop sure. Oil. Sure. And what is Surefire Crop Oil? It's a surfactant that's going to make the herbicide stick to the plant. Correct. Yeah. 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 It's, yeah. It's, it's definitely, you have to to use as a fact and with it. So I actually use it with my gliophosphate. Yeah. Yeah. A lot I, of people use do. It, I use it. I mean, it just seems to have a better kill. Yeah. A lot of people yeah, do. Yeah. So. It's definitely a good thing. Yeah. So just wanted to mention that. So I think that's a conclusion to uh, our spring food plot, planning a new food plot episode here. And let's just say to guys, get out there and, and, you know, have get a great planting. spring. Yeah. Get the plant. <laughs> Cause it's that time of year. And I want to thank you, Brandon, for, uh, for being here with yes, us. Sir. Uh, want to remind everybody, if you like our podcast, you know, make sure you subscribe to it again. We're doing seven spring topics here in the spring, and we're going to be doing seven more in the fall mm-hmm. that are all kind of fall-related topics. Um, some more topics that we have coming up for us, we're going to be doing a, a rant show. We're kind of going to go through some of the bonehead things that we deal with on a, on a pretty regular basis. And then we're going to be having a call with some folks out at Whitetail Properties to talk to them about habitat management, soil health, um, some of the key buzzwords, hinge cutting, you know, prescribed burns. So we have that uh, podcast coming up as well. So we hope you enjoyed this podcast, and we'll see you on the next one.